Well, my name is Terry L. John. Uh, my non plume, by the way, is Terry T.J. Sadaropoulos. So this is my book here. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the founding of the World War II Historical Reenactment Society, which, by the way, was the uh, first headquarters in my house. At Florissant, Missouri. I'm the first president and founder. Yeah, it's 40, this year marks the 40th anniversary. Long, long time ago, I got started collecting World War II stuff. About the time I was junior high school, I was seriously collecting the stuff where I had closets full of uniforms. Uh, my brother got me started in hunting and shooting guns. Next thing, one thing led to another, and this is back in the uh, early 60s. Uh, this is the days when you could buy uh, 1917 Cosmoline U.S. infield rifles from famous and bar department store for $29.95. Nowadays, one, a good one will cost you $900. I ended up, my mother bought me a, a British surplus, number one Mark III infield rifle, 16 bucks in old army surplus store. And next thing you know, I ended up with a World War II German rifle, eight millimeter Mauser, made in BNZ in 1943. And my dad gave me his souvenir got mittens, God with us, belt buckle that he brought back from North Africa. He was an MP guarding German prisoners in Algiers back during the war. And that was the spark, which I mentioned in the book, that started me collecting the World War II stuff real, uh, seriously. Now I had the rifle, I had a belt buckle, well I had to get a bayonet, I had to get an ammo pouch. Uh, one thing led to another and a relative gave me a helmet that they brought back from Normandy and I was off and running. Now back in the old days before there was a reenactment society, and by the way as far as I know I'm the first one to ever put on an organized World War II reenactment anywhere in the world. I was at Weldon Spring, Memorial Day weekend, 1975, and it was hot, it was humid, it was miserable. Thank God for that run thunderstorm that came up, cooled things off of it. The mosquitoes were out in four, the ticks were bloodthirsty. I mentioned this in the book, and it was so miserable. It was so miserable, so uncomfortable. I have a friend that started the Indiana Military Museum in Vincennes, Indiana, Judge Osborne. He came to that very first reenactment and he said, I will never do a reenactment again in the rest of my life. Well, I like to go to his reenactments that he has nowadays at his museum and needle him and say, you remember when you went to a reenactment ever, 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 ever? Well, it was so miserable, like I said, naturally, of course, we had to do it again, but in a cooler time of the year, so that October, we had the, another one. And that, the uh, participation doubled in just six months. We had now pe had people coming from out of state. And I thought, we're on to something here. But I just said, no. one thing we need, we need a name. Because people would ask me, well, who are you? And I'd say, well, didn't know what to say. I said, well, hmm bunch of nuts that like to go out and pretend it's World War II and shoot blanks at one another. No, that don't really cut it. So I uh, decided to come up with the name of the World War II Historical Reenactment Society. And by the way, it wasn't long before a nickname uh, surfaced uh, called the World War II Hysterical Reactionary Society. And I mentioned in there that sometimes uh, leading a bunch of volunteers who aren't getting paid who have to have somewhat of a high ego because you're out doing something that nobody else is doing. So after all the bullets that died, the gunfire died down, I asked the fellow, if I could find a spot in the St. Louis area, would you guys come out to reenact World War II? And without hesitation, they all replied, yes. In the old days, some of us collectors would get out and we'd put our uniforms on and we'd pretend to make home war movies like Steven Spielberg did when he started and uh, we pretend to light the cigarettes, pass the vino bottle around, drive our little Cuba wagons and zoom out motorcycles about. And, sit, and, and of course, we were all wearing original stuff back in the old days, the welded spring. And we'll get the welded spring here in a minute. So when I went back to St. Louis, and I was determined, by the way, you can read about this in my book, The History Channel Presents uh, Bridge to Time. He said, 
Have you thought about Weldon Spring Army Reserve Training Center in St. Charles County, next county out from St. Louis? I'd never heard of the place. Well, he told me to go by. Lieutenant Colonel Williams, Marvin Hildegoss were there with me, went into the office and asked him, is there any way we reenact your guys to get out of Weldon Spring Army Reserve Training Center? And he said, yeah. He gave me the sergeant's name and went out there and the less became reenacting history. And we started that in 1975, May. And in the first three years we had the, at Weldon Spring, in the first couple of years we had spectators out there. Now spectators were really good, well suited out there because they didn't have restroom facilities, they didn't have uh, uh, food available and they hardly had adequate parking. Eventually, Weldon Spring became the members only war game center. Another fellow started the uh, reenactments at Jefferson Barrett County Park in St. Louis County, and that became the uh, spectator battle. We have a thing called World War II weekend there every uh, last full, way, full weekend of April. I mentioned in my book how the reenacting started at Weldon Spring, Missouri. And then sometime, I forget what, read about it in the book, where that was the world's largest producer of TNT at one time. The uh, U.S. government forced the people out of three towns and they built a giant explosive factory there prior to us being in the war. Well, by World War II, it was the largest employer, I think, in St. Louis area. I want it, if not the the most, the second largest. They shut it down. The National Guard moved out. The EPA did some kind of studies and find out not only was there contaminants from the World War II production of explosive material, but say, after the war, immediately after the war, Mallinckrodt built a uh, nuclear bomb facility. Uh, they weren't making bomb, they were making like uranium in part of the uh, ground there. And they built a big factory after the war there and they had all these contaminants from that. And when they were first, the EPA was first testing for radioactive stuff, then they discovered all the other contaminants from the explosive days from World War II. So the place pretty well shut down and good to know if you knew. Well, it, it went out of style. It, they closed up. We couldn't go out there for, for, I think, for almost 20 years. And finally, we got to go back in. The Army's in best that uh, or the government has pumped a bunch of money, money into the place, built some new building. We got to go back. And when you know it, I found myself being interviewed by Chris Griga of 88 Millimeter Productions, who was making a documentary about the start of World War II reenacting in the United States. I gave it a plug in my book back there. Chris, can you get, get that? Uh, what's it say? Something about a true story about pretend war. Directed by Chris Giga. You know, I was a 25-year-old baby-faced kid when this started. And here I am. I used to joke with Fred Pottick, who, by the way, is in the book. He was founded the first SS reenactment unit. Fred Pottick, his father, by the way, he was, father served in the uh, 5th Armored Division in Europe. And Fred was telling a story in there that he had he had never told me, but he was, he was talking about it in the uh, documentary about uh, how when he was in high school, he bought some uh, stuff from um, German World War II stuff from a janitor, and he goes home and shows his dad, hey dad, look at this cool stuff I got. And the old man goes, ah, we used to wipe our butts with that stuff and throw it in the gutter. <laughs> I've written a book, and here it is. The Hitler Channel presents, everybody know that that's a uh, moniker for the History Channel. The Hitler Channel presents A Bridge to Time, A Journey. It's actually my journey, my story about how I uh, got interested in World War II and how the uh, WW2 HRS got founded and started. And it's uh, two books in one. It's my World War II, What If I Could Have Killed Hitler off novel. And in this like I said, the story about how I got interested in World War II and how they, at the end, they uh, talk about how the reenactment started. This is the, actually, this year is the 40th anniversary of the founding, when I made this the commemorative issue, by the way. When I was redoing my book, 
I pumped a whole bunch more pictures in it, and at the end of it, in this version here, we have the uh, about 30 plus pictures from Weldon Spring in the early day, back in 1975 through 78, when I was president of the WW2 HRF. When I turned 60, I decided it was time for me to go to Germany. Of course, I naturally went to all the museums I could. I went to nine different countries. I went to uh, over Salzburg, stayed in uh, the Hotel Zum Turken, which was uh, Hitler's Reich security headquarters for his home, which was right next door to his mountain home in Bavaria. I walked Hitler's favorite walk that he used to take in the afternoon, or he used to take it late in the morning until the war got started and then things got in the way and he could take it later on in the afternoon. Down to a little overlook that overlooks the uh, Berchtesgarden, uh, Berchtesgarden, yeah, Berchtesgarden Valley. I had seen on TV this program called Killing Hitler. It's kind of a docudrama about the British SOE plan, a special operations plan where they were going to insert a sniper team into his mountain home. Well, as I was walking his little favorite walk, I couldn't help but think to myself, where would I be if I was a British sniper gonna kill Hitler? And I saw the perfect spot. Now the book is mostly that novel about trying to kill Hitler. It's all about what would have happened if the SOE had actually got their plan together, which by the way, they never did. Eventually they canceled it, so it never happened. What if they could have, what might have happened the SOE had gotten their plan together and had actually gone through with it. That's what my story. I tried to pump as much historical fact, now, since I've been studying this stuff since I was in junior high school, as I could into my story. It's full of footnotes where I try and keep you abreast of the actual real story of what was going on, a little tidbits of information here and there, such as things that the, did you know when the, Twinkies first came out. You know, originally they were full of banana cream, but banana cream was rationed during the war and it became full of van vanilla cream as, cream as a result, and it's been that way ever since. The book starts out I'm a, when I was born, at the same time when a war movie was being made in Germany. It happened to be one of my favorite war movies, Decision Before Dawn. And they've been playing that recently, very often on the Fox channel. In fact, they just had it on the other day before I left. Decision Before Dawn was filmed in 1949, 1950 in Würzburg, Germany. And there's a lot of references to uh, World War II movies throughout the book. In fact, I've been in a couple of World War II movies myself. I've been in some war movies, and I talk about that. Here we are in front of that 1936 LaSalle that I put in my book, you know. When I had the uh, two officers uh, report to uh, Winston Churchill in my book, because Winston wants to know how that uh, plot to uh, assassinate Adolf Hitler's come along. Originally, I had him in a nondescript staff car, and I thought, well, you idiot, why don't you write your own car into the story? Yeah, why the heck don't I? So I put my 1936 Canadian-built LaSalle staff car into the story. Read all about it. 